Now, I'm going to ask Matthew uh, to talk about anything he wants, but what I'm going to concentrate is to find out why he is so good. I mean, I've never seen an office so large as his, and his name is taller than, you know, almost, um, I would say, 30 feet. And so he must be hugely successful. He's got so many clients, so people must flock to him to ask for his advice. And I'm trying to find out, uh, you know, for you, uh, what he does. Why is his advice so valuable? Why is he such a clever dick? And uh, so this is the kind of thing. And how the world is changing so fast with the internet and the cyberspace, and what consequences that PR has today, as opposed to the days when things and information does not travel as fast as it is today. So now, Matthew, do you want to say anything to anybody uh, about PR as a general subject? No, I was rather hoping you'd just keep talking. Well, yes, <laughs> Matthew. Uh, Tim, Bell, Tim Bell came and he said he taught you everything about PR and that, um, uh, and that you owe him everything. It's is true. That I, 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 went, I went to see Tim Bell when I, I started my company when I was about 21. And I went to see Tim Bell, who was the, the, the grand old man even then of uh, the industry. Um, and I said, look, you know, Tim, I'm a huge fan of everything you've done. And you're, you know, my idol. I, I, I'd love some advice about this little company that I've started. And, you know, it's, it's hard, but we're making progress. And, and Tim, between tokes of his cigarette and swinging on his bottle, said, um, just give up. <laughs> I mean, just give up. Just he can't defy gravity. Just, just go and do something else. And uh, so that was the only advice. Uh, apparently... No, no, no. So, so I said, well, I'm actually, I'm not going to do that because I quite like it. And he said, well, then invoice in advance. <laughs> <laughs> did you always invoice in advance? Yes, I did always. Invoice in fact, in uh, you will not remember this, but uh, you invoiced me in advance. I well, was well, the well, first well. way to the customer, and you conned me at ten thousand pounds uh, because I was told that you were very good, and I was, I was, I was. So, so the one, the one thing I will say about PR is, it, and if I've done anything right over the thirty years I've been doing this, it's, it's to choose um, the people that I work with and represent, because ultimately. And, and, and increasingly, the, the only thing you can do is provide access to people or ideas or information. And, and if they're good, then they fly, and if they're not good, then they don't. And, and if there has been a change in PR over the last 25 years, it's, 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 it's been to reduce the ability of people like me to, to, to make things seem better than they are for very long. There was a, a period, we, you know, we all grew up with this expression that you can fool all of the people some of the time and you can fool some of the people all the time you can't. It's fair to assume now that you can't really fool any of the people any of the time because partly because of social media, partly because of an underfunded and, and impotent media, actually people get it right about, about things. And, and so I very early decided that I would only represent people that I liked, people that I believed in who had interesting and excellent products and services. The exception was David Tang, <laughs> um, who, 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 who ticked the first sort of two or three boxes on that list. Um, but, but the product that he uh, employed me to develop was an ice cream cone full of Chinese food. <laughs> because I thought that it was very difficult to eat Chinese food because you have to use two hands. And I went to see Edward the and I said, how can we make people go around eating Chinese food like with one hand a sandwich or a or a or a, or a hot dog, uh, and I said that you need the other hand for for the phone or fiddling, picking your nose and so forth. And I invented an ice cream cone, uh, and you put soon as I walk into it. Um, I'm afraid not even Matthew Ford was able to work well, well, so 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 he asked, he asked me to work out whether or not this was a saleable idea. And I could have told him there and then. Um, that it wasn't. But fortunately, he was prepared to pay me ten thousand pounds to take to my wish to come back and tell us that it wasn't a But now, let's let, let's. I mean, Tim talked a lot about his the good old days when he was masterful and so forth. And in a way, his book Right and Wrong, slightly bemoaning the fact that you know the glorious golden days are gone and PR and so forth. And uh, not surprisingly, because the world has changed. Now, you mentioned, of course the way in which the social media has actually changed the world. Now, we also, uh, 
met recently and talked about cyber crime. Now, you published a, a, a one of your uh, monthly, not quarterly journals or whatever, specifically on this subject. I mean, how extensive is it? Is there anything, I mean, there's a, is there a real criminal world or an illicit world in which everybody is hacking into everything and the criminals are taking advantage and making huge profits out of all these uh, clandestine activities? I read somewhere a quote that said there are only two types of companies, those that know they've been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. Um, but they're all hacked. They're all hacked. So, so, so we, we are these people. Are, 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 are yes. Are yes. you hacked? Yes. I mean, we, 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 we in the last month, I think we saw a five thousand percent increase on the number of attempts to get through the firewalls on our servers, um, and and that was because we'd done something that attracted a little bit of attention. But, but like what? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that would be one innocent. What um, uh, No. It was, it was a, uh, there was a, a piece in the newspaper about a client that worked um, no. and, and What, Philip Green? <laughs> we can talk about this. <laughs> I, am, I am prepared to talk about Philip Green, but, but for now, cybercrime. So, so, right. so, so there, are, there are constant attempts to, to, to uh, mine information for anything that's valuable. And a lot of that is, is, is done on an automated basis. So, so it's it's not about you know it's, it's it, you think that you feel safe because you go well who would want to target me I don't know the thing or I don't have enough money or I don't have enough uh, profile but 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 you know if you think about a Google bot that can look at trillions of pages of information in less than one hundredth of a second and return immediate results that you know that's who you're being hacked by you're being hacked by automated bots that are crawling over every single web address, every IP address, every email account, and looking for bank account details, or looking for information that they can use and they can sell. So, so if you, there is a price list that you can get on the dark web where you can buy um, a bank account with in numbers for you know, 100 $150, you can buy an email uh, address and its code for $40 or $50, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's it's like going to a channel. But I mean, the other day, Carter said that he published in the Sun newspaper, the most popular newspaper in the world, I suppose, uh, his bank account, uh, his sort code, and his address. And he defied everybody who uh, were able to pinch any man out of his account. On the whole, he was right, except the Diabetes Association apparently managed to squeeze a 500 pound standing order out of his account. Uh, but um, how do you explain that? So, so, so the, the data that people are getting is not particularly valuable. Um, so, so access to an email account or access to to a bank details rather than access to an actual bank account. When you get important clients, do they ask you what sort of security you have, and do they actually have their own experts come and make sure that things? I, I, are... I, I, I think all of us are shockingly lax when it comes to. Cyber security. I mean, we, we have a reasonably strong firewall around our servers, but you know, personally, I haven't changed my password on anything for 20 years, and I'd say that goes for most people. And um, I think if, if, if you knew how bad it was, you, you wouldn't take precautions. You'd sort of shoot yourself. But it, you so, so it, I think it's much easier to live in in a reasonable level of ignorance. The, the only advice that we can give people is is to us you, you have to assume that everything you do is pretty transparent. And and that, therefore the easiest thing to do is to not do anything terribly wrong. I mean do you hesitate when you are about to press a button on a porn site or, or <laughs> very gently. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't really care. <laughs> yeah. But um, other than that the sort of PR you are now dispensing obviously substantially it's got to do with coping with the, the, the with way in which information is spread so fast and so extensively. I mean, has that really changed in front of your eyes in the last yeah, 10 years? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, if you were clever, you could write a, a draw a graph, which, which was, uh, uh, on one axis would be impact and the other impact would, or access would be reach. And, and so, so, you know, when I started, there were a very small number of media outlets that were very, very powerful. 
So, so you know, there were a handful of newspapers, there were a handful of important magazines, and there were a couple of TV news bulletins. And they would, and they really made a difference because you know you, the, the, the audiences were 10, 20 times what they are today. The Sun, you know, used to have 12, 15 million readers off of a base of four and a half, five million copies. And now three, it's, three million circulation, uh, 15 million readers. Yeah. Now it's 1.6, 1.65, with and, and it's it's unclear, you know, whether whether the impact. But it's not just that there are fewer newspapers selling less copies. It's that there are billions of information sources. So so suddenly you've got this incredibly democratic landscape where all of us have a Twitter account and an Instagram account, and we have blogs and we have blogs and and, and my daughter Charlotte, who I haven't mentioned yet, but I have to mention five times during. <laughs> That's not oh, the that um, uh, So they rank almost pari passu with with the established media. But I mean, I mean, we always hear Taylor Swift has got eighty five million followers and so forth. But I mean, what does that actually mean? I mean, it means that eighty five million would have would have gone onto her account. The, 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 the important thing it means is that she has a direct access to her. So, so pre pre previously, she used to have to rely on entertainment correspondents, on major newspapers and magazines, to, to communicate what she wanted to say to her fan base. And, and that would be through a filter, which either liked her or didn't like her, or thought she was in the ascendance or in the way. She now doesn't have to worry about what the mainstream media says, because if she has something to say, she can say it direct. And the mainstream media will actually pick up from what she's saying on her own feed and amplify it still further, and it becomes a sort of particle accelerator where social media feeds into conventional media, which feeds back into social media, which feeds back into conventional media. But I mean, the graph you were talking about does not take into one important factor, in my mind, is the intensity. So you could say, you know, you, 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 the, 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 it's reached 3 million people, it's reached 10 million people, but now the time in which people would read something and digest it is a reduced considerably. So you could have an extraordinary number of hits or um, potential hits, but at the same time, the impact is not perhaps as great as one might think. It's like Chinese food. It's Chinese food. Chinese food. Why? In, 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 it's increasingly short-lived. <laughs> you know, well, we get very hungry very soon afterwards. Yes. Yes. Why is the evidence cheap? Well, it, it, so, so the, 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 the nourishment of old media, where. where a, 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 a significant um, uh, piece of information would really land and, and be uh, discussed, and, and, and you know you knew that if something was on a front page of a newspaper, it would be talked about in in playgrounds and kitchens and pubs that night, and it would then be chewed over by columnists and by you know by, by pundits. And, and now uh, the, the the intensity and frequency of the of the media barrage is. It, it, it means that the vast majority of stuff doesn't land. What's also happened is you've got a media that increasingly works on its own agenda rather than necessarily that of its readers or viewers or listeners. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced that the readers of the tabloid newspapers are as interested in the outcome of the European election as the owners and proprietors of those newspapers would have to believe, because what they're really doing is putting a, a, a warning shot to the politicians that are based on their agenda. They would like this outcome. But, but you know, so the Mail on Sunday, for instance, are uh, uh, completely consumed with the idea that we spend too much on foreign aid. So we made a commitment some time ago to, to spend 0.8 or 0.8 of, of our national GDP on, on, on international development. And that was part of the manifesto promise and it was then delivered on and, 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 and turned into law. And uh, for the last <coughs> five or six weeks, uh, the Mail on Sunday have devoted between six and 15 pages to complaining about the amount of money that Britain spends on overseas aid. Well, I, I genuinely don't believe that the readers of the Mail on Sunday care that much about this particular issue, but the <laughs> editorial line that's taken is absolutely about a sort of personal letter. And, and that's the way that media loses power. When, when media ceases to reflect the opinions and the characteristics of its... So you think the mayor is losing now? Hard it is increasingly the most 
popular site in the world. 260 million, 260 million bits in a week. And no economy behind it at all. So, so I think, well, yeah, I think that... They I think are trying to stuff the people with the videos. I think, I, think, I, think, I think the newspaper is still enormously powerful. And I think the reach of the website is remarkable. But I'm not sure the muscularity of the newspaper exists on the website. But I mean, the Huffington came up and said that, you know, actually people don't really want to read about the experts of India anymore. All they care about is what their peers say. But of course, if you look at Huffington Post today, still the most read articles are the famous journalists, or those who are the authority, and it's not just Joe Bloggs, you know, blogging and saying things. So, but it's it's, 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 I think it's more meritocratic. I think, I think that the fact that you have a column in a newspaper doesn't automatically give you access to that newspaper's audience. You sort of have to earn it. And if, you know, if, if, if you write a, a poor advice column in the NFT, then people aren't going to read it. Well, I don't because know. you write an excellent advice on the NFT, then you have the stature of that. Every Saturday, yeah, is <laughs> <laughs> the young, the young. <laughs> Okay, well, look, listen, uh, let's, let's get some uh, questions going. You know, enlighten things up. Uh, controversial or uh, needling and um, uh, intelligent. Um, I just spotted somebody nodding off, so I'm not going to identify the person, but uh, please wake up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Stop talking. Get the mic. You go over that side. Yeah. Please, sorry. Stop talking, but I'll take the mic. Um, you talked about how with social media, you can't fool any of the people any of the time. How do you explain the rise of Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I think Donald Trump is a, I have to be slightly careful about this, but I think Donald Trump is, is not the problem. Um, I, I think America is, or middle America is the problem. I, I, think, I think partly as a result of a, of a really extreme TV media environment, uh, that there is a, a, a level of disinformation mistrust and anger in the American people about what's happened in their mind to their country. Uh, and because I think they're not well served by, by um, particularly television uh, media, uh, Donald Trump has become the answer to what they see as a problem. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it does slightly beggar belief that it, it is possible that in a year's time the President of America and the Prime Minister of England could sit down for a bilateral meeting and you could have Boris Johnson and Donald Trump sitting oh across the table with each other. And or Corbyn. That's likely. Um, <laughs> but, but, but something has gone slightly wrong with a democratic system but don't that, 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 produces, that produces anonymous results. But, but that, nonetheless, if Donald Trump which he might have done already, asked you as his method, now look, what, what do I do? I mean, I thought he was a complete idiot, but now I think he's a genius because, you know, in political races, you always have to watch the last furlong. And of course, now the idea is that in the last three months, Hillary Clinton is going to trip up. Mm -hmm. Now, Donald Trump has no possibility of tripping up because he's got so mad, nothing to say anymore would actually matter and he cannot trip up. This Machiavellian thing. So if he said to you, now, have I done, done it right? Would you actually say you just carry on the way you do? Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it, 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 he's not wrong, it's the system that's, got, that's gone wrong. If my, my you know, if you'll allow a, a, a brief bit of, of sort of family history, my great uncle was a man called Edward Bernays who, who effectively invented public relations, is sort of acknowledged as the father of public relations. And, and he, he worked for the Republican Party um, in the 1890s and through the, the uh, early 19th century. Having, having studied his uncle Sigmund Freud's work, and, and he, he took a lot of Freud's insights and learnings and used them through media to, to, to what he called the science of influencing public opinion. Um, and he was the first person to use focus groups with politicians. And 
he, he told politicians, which was at the time was a, a completely revolutionary thought, which was tell people what they want to hear. Because prior to that, politicians had told people what they thought. Politicians had gone out and said, you know, we, we believe in small government or big government, we believe in high taxes, or we believe in equality, or we believe in slavery, or we don't believe in slavery. But but they, they had they had come up with a political manifesto which 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 they espoused not based on its popularity, but based on their political dogma, their political ethos. So they, they were, you know, whether they were economists or whether they were social reformers, they were motivated by what they thought was right for society. And that was all of society. So, so, so the, you know, the, the founding idea of American democracy, which was we the people. And that was all the people. That, you know, so politicians talked to all of the people. And, and what Bernays did was he said, look, if you, if you speak to this particular demographic, and you tell them you're going to lower taxes for the middle class, they'll vote for you. And, and clearly, lowering taxes for the middle class is not going to play well to the working class, but we've worked out the maths. And actually, you can win this election if you can increase your share of the middle class vote. And so suddenly, we the people becomes, well, we the people who earn more than $50,000 but less than 80, or we the people who aren't going to trade unions, or we the people who aspire to you know, be small businessmen. And, 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 and that was, it, it, very, very divisive term. And, and what you now have is a, a, a political environment that only concerns itself with how well a message plays to a particular audience at a particular time. And so Donald Trump has gone out in a very calculated way and talked to about 30% of America, but in a way that is completely uh, 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 designed to attract their support and their vote in a complicated electoral college, which we don't understand, yeah. certainly none of this in this room understands, with caucuses and um, uh, uh, you know, people who have to be members of the party or don't have to be members of the party or independents, unbelievably complicated and convoluted system to allow the American people a choice of two people. So you've got 250 million people, or 300 million people, who will vote in the present election, and they're given the choice between two people. The number of people who decide who those two people are, in real terms, is probably 35,000 significant delegates within the Republican and Democratic Party. Of course, if you if you go down to the super donors, the people who actually fund those campaigns, it's more like 150 people who decide who those two people are, who this greatest democracy on earth will then be allowed to choose that guy or that guy. And as David completely correctly says, look, the only thing you know about a two-horse race is that if one horse falls over, the other one wins. And so, so it, it, you can have the greatest thoroughbred horse race in the world against a three-legged donkey. And if the thoroughbred falls over, the donkey will win. It doesn't make him the second best horse. It just makes him the other horse in the race. And so the danger with Trump is that you have the most overqualified candidate in American presidential history since Buchanan, uh, 17-something. He said Hillary has had eight years in the White House as a First Lady and eight years in uh, the administration as a, 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 a secretary, a senator, or a, um, uh, a secretary of state, running against someone who clearly is not qualified to, to hold high office. I mean, you can, whatever you think about Trump, he is, he, there is nothing in his history that suggests he's qualified to, to, to be the commander in chief of the most powerful country on earth. And not really, or half the people became president. Um, that's the way the world works. It, yes, it, it, but it's a worry, don't you? No, I think it would be very good if Trump came, became president. I think it would completely fuck up America. <laughs> <laughs> you want to fuck up America? <laughs> no, I'm just amusing. <laughs> because you know, we don't understand, I mean, isn't it true that we outsiders perceive uh, America from the the West Coast, the Jews in the Hollywood, and the Jews in, 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 in New York. Now, let's be, let's be frank, Jewish. The, the, the two democratic strongholds. The middle of America is like a sort of a huge sandwich with a huge, huge lot of beef in, in the middle. And we don't understand that they're God worshipping right wing bigots and, and, and those people who, who, who love what Trump does. Just think of the way in which they rebel every time so successfully against firearms. I mean, the, the ridiculousness of. I mean, 400 million guns in the country, more than the population itself, is absurd. Everybody killed. I mean, I don't understand it. Anyway, look, I, I'm not Matthew Floyd. No. <laughs>
can somebody ask him? Yes, lady in the back. Hi. He's not my man. You look as if you've got a soft voice. <laughs> I think I have quite a loud voice. Um, you spoke earlier about media and about how um, it works now, social media, and what do you think it's going to do in the future? What do you think media will look like in the next 10 years? Um, honestly, I, I have not a clue. Um, I, I, think, I think you can, you can plot the trajectory of, of conventional media. Um, that there is, there is no question that the influence and reach of newspapers and magazines is going to decrease. Uh, that, that television um, is going to become more and more and more um, uh, disintermediated and disrupted. Uh, that social media will continue to grow. But, but what that looks like, I, I think is, is, it's impossible to, to define it as anything that we would recognize as a, as a media environment, because you, you, you've, you've gone from a handful of, of media organizations around the world with incredibly high barriers to entry, both from a regulatory standpoint and a financial standpoint. So, you know, it, it, I mean, so if, if I take my, just not even my lifetime, my career, so, so 30 years ago when I started um, Freud's, the, the Channel 4 hadn't launched. Okay, so, so there are, there are three television channels, it's BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV, that's it. And they all stop broadcasting at midnight. Uh, and there are six, seven newspapers. Not even breakfast, breakfast television. Breakfast television, came. Bre breakfast television had not been launched yeah. uh, at the point. So they, yeah, they came on air sort of about lunchtime and they went off at midnight. And they, they played God's Open Queen at the end and then stood up. Uh, and and there, was a, there was a handful of magazines. Um, and. So, so, so the people controlling that, the, the, the broadcast media was, was entirely regulated the state control. There was one independent station that uh, was, was a public voted company, and the other was, was a royal chartered uh, public service broadcaster. Um, and the newspapers were owned by four, five press barons, and the magazines were owned by two companies. There were basically two magazine companies in the country. So, so you, you've gone from, from literally a handful of voices to to, to, I mean, what we're heading for is seven billion voices. In fact, we're going to eight billion voices. But you know, I don't know when the next billion of population lacks. But, 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 so, so that you, you just can't, you can't chart that exponential. I mean, it's you know, it's like the the grain of rice you put on a a, a chessboard, and then two on the next one, and four on the next one, and, and by the time you get to the power of two, it's, it's so that the power not enough brain in the world. Not enough brains brain in the world. So, so that there, there aren't enough brains in the world to represent the number of media voices that we. And, and in 25 years, you know, so, so we, we've gone from 10 to, to 10 billion. But it's different between that and influence, isn't it? I mean, you mentioned BBC. Now, the BBC has probably got the most um, prestigious provenance of any media company in the world's history. And sometimes I think the Brits themselves don't understand how influential the BBC is. When they say that you've got to cut world service, I think they're absolutely ridiculous uh, in, 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 in believing that. So do you think the BBC, for example, let's take that as an example, will maintain its tremendous influence in your lifetime, let's say, you know, let's not say, you know. I think, I, think, I think the BBC might be the only media organisation on earth. Not CNN? No, ultimately CNN is a, is a division of Time Warner. Time Warner will probably be sold to someone over the next year who will take a look at CNN and say, well, why would I continue to subsidise the loss making television network? They've already closed half of their bureaus, they're already laying off journalists. I mean, it, it's a less and less good product. The only broadcaster in the world, the only news organization in the world that will be able to afford to have correspondents and bureaus in every single uh, uh, important market is the BBC. And they can do that because they have the ability to work not based on what advertisers want or based on subscribers want or what their ratings are, but based on a mandate they have from the government through a license fee that we all pay. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the best. Value. So it is the exception. It's the exception. a single exception. Good. So if the BBC asks you tomorrow, if Tony Hall rang you up and said, what should we do in the next 10 years? 
How would you advise them to maintain at least that position and not increase their income? Yeah, does, does, is there anyone here think there's anything wrong with the BBC? It, 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 I mean, it, it, I believe the BBC is the best run government owned thing anywhere in the world. I, I don't think there's, there, I think there's nothing that government runs in, in terms of, of police forces or transportation systems or public health services. It, it, you know, government is not very good at efficiency. It's not very good at running large-scale operations. The, the BBC is, is, a, is a stunningly good organization in terms of its output, you know, both, both from news, from radio, from online. I mean, the, you know, the, I, the iPlayer, had the iPlayer been developed by a commercial company, that company would sort of rank along with YouTube or Facebook or Google. You know, it's, it's a staggeringly effective piece of technology that was used to give more people access to more content on the basis of where they wanted it without trying to drive a company into it, without trying to dictate on what platform it was, or you know, it could be a Netflix model saying you could only get this if you subscribe to, to our service. So, so I, I'm, a, I'm a passionate supporter of the BBC, and, and the fact that it skews a, a, a commercial market, it actually means there's less competition amongst commercial workers. But if you've been to America, it's impossible to watch television in America. I mean, there are adverts, there, there, there seems to be more adverts than programming. You're interrupted every, what, five, six, seven minutes by adverts. Is it the same in, on a porn channel? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I called you up with that. <laughs> Sorry, another question. It's been in China, isn't it? It's been in China for a long time now. For the first time, is it right there? They're sending people, reporters, to Oh, no, 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 there are millions. Sorry, no, I, didn't, I didn't expect this, sorry. No, 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 no. the BBC has been in China for a long time. But, but they're, they, they're they... upping it, aren't they? They're what? They're, up, well, they're, they're making more of it. <laughs> well, I don't know the exact numbers, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> they've always been around during my lifetime. Um, but anyway, the BBC is, is, is exceptional in, in, in that sense. So, so, so I would say the only, to, to very long-winded, or answer to your extra question. The, 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 only, the only solid prediction I would make for the, the, the state of media in 10 years' time is that the BBC will be even more uh, influential and even more uh, 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 unique in a, in a global environment where, where the commercial interests of media owners will increasingly be put far ahead of what the consumers want. Yeah, but, a bit, but because it's backed by erudition, I mean, if you think about the radio, I mean, you wouldn't have thought that you could create a program or a radio station like Radio 4, where everything said on that program, day in and day out, 24 hours, 7, is interesting. I mean, the Archer, I mean, if you told somebody, you know, who's never heard, heard radio, that, that, that there could be something like that going on for 40 years, 50 years, and so on, you wouldn't believe it. But it is incredible. My, my, my dad did a program called Just a Minute, which he started doing in 1964. And, 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 you know, 60 years later, that, that form, that's four, four. Who is a fan of 60 Minutes, uh, of Just a Minute? Yeah. I, think it's the it, best, it, I think it's the best program it, in the world. It, it, it's a very, it's a it's it's a very simple idea. If, 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 if that was on a commercial network, it would have been cancelled after two seasons or three seasons. Or someone would have said, oh, it's getting a bit stale, we'll commission something else. But the BBC has, has the confidence to be able to program for generations, as opposed to for the next quarter's uh, rating. Yeah, well, we, we, we should be, I mean, the BBC should be thanking us uh, <laughs> today. Yes. Hello. Um, if you were starting out for it right now as a 23-year-old man, do you think you'd be as successful as you are now? Or do you think you just had a particular set of skills suitable for that time? I, I wouldn't start a PR company now. Um, I mean, I, I think because I don't have very many skills and I wasn't very well educated and I don't have much of a work ethic, but I am reasonably good with, with, with people. I think, I think whatever I... What do you mean by that? I mean, lots of people come to an interview and I say, well, what are you about? He said, I'm very good with people. Now, what does that mean? I mean, do you 
you suck up to them or you, you, I mean, you give me the beautiful girl, you're particularly oily, rich man, what do you mean by particularly good? I mean, you were thrown out of school, you went off to another school, and then you were practically thrown out of that, and you were particularly good with people. What do you mean by that? Um, I think I am quite persuasive. And I'm quite. Well, you had two wives. And I'm, so that's good. Okay. Obviously, I'm quite articulate. A legitimate child, so that's good. So, very persuasive. All right. Well, we're stopping. <laughs> yes. But you have a last question already. All right, well, I'll try to be short. My questions are always short and erudite. But let's see. Um, I, hear, I was here at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, a media conference, and one of the astonishing uh, Learnings was that the younger folk in the uh, in the audience are, are spending no more than seven or eight seconds on a piece of content. How do you think that impacts on PR, advertising, uh, media products generally? That's what I meant by intensity. Yeah, I, 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 I mean on advertising, I think it's it's. Um, I think advertising is, is going to face a very, very substantial um, uh, uh, problem uh, as, as, as it really becomes apparent that as consumers, we, we consume content in exactly the way that we want to and we reject. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know about you, but when, when a video pops up, a video ad pops up, when I'm looking for something online, I, I, a, I try and skip it or come off the site. I think I think poorly of the site that I'm on. I think even more poorly of, of the company that's decided they're going to interrupt my pursuit of a particular story by telling me about their car or their sneakers or their uh, soft drink. Um, I think we, we we work quite hard to avoid advertising and marketing. And so the only advertising and marketing that works is 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 engaging, interesting message that, that we want. And, and and the thing that the internet has done very well and that Google is is extraordinarily brilliant at is is to begin to service ads that that meet the kind of portfolio of interest that we have. So if you, I don't know to what extent you've noticed how the majority of ads that you run into are relevant to your spending habits, and 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 this is uh, it's it's darker than you think. We talked about being hacked. Um, when, when you click on I'll, I'll take a minute to tell you this because it's, it's important. When you click on a, an article or a piece of content online, that click goes to a data center in America with all of the information about all of your browsing habits and all of your spending patterns and all of the accounts and all of the digital information in a, in a, in a packet which is, is sent with that click. And in 0.012 of a second, an auction takes place amongst hundreds of computers who are buying ads on behalf of car companies and holiday companies and cosmetic companies and fashion companies. And, and by the time the page loads with an ad, that auction will have been concluded and one of those companies will have been the successful bidder to get in front of your eyeballs and, and, and this process takes less than a quarter of a second um, and is based on an increasingly intimate set of, of bits of data. One of the most worrying things about this is, is that the sophistication of the algorithms that look at our browsing habits, and I'll give you one example. Google now know if a woman is pregnant before she does. The way they've done this is, is to look at women who are pregnant and then to look at their browsing habits on Google in the three weeks before they search for when is my baby due or am I late for my period or whatever it is. And they then compare those three weeks of browsing with the three weeks in previous menstrual cycles of the same woman. And they found subtle differences in the way that we were searching, the way that women were searching, at the point where their hormones begin to change because they're carrying a fertilized egg. 
And that information is then sold to companies to say this woman is pregnant. And so, and I, I, I mean, I knew this, but my niece, who, who I told this to, she said, oh my God, that's really extraordinary because a week before I found out I was pregnant, I was starting to get ads from Malika. You've got a telephone you can ring up to find out whether you're pregnant or not. <laughs> it's not I think it's not a telephone. The, 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 so, so the more serious implications is Google know if your if your 15 year old daughter <laughs> is about to commit suicide. Google know. I mean, they know because if you, you they, they know the profile. So, so, so they absolutely know the profile of every teenage attempted suicide, suicide, and they and they will know two, three, four months out from a likely suicide attempt that, that someone is high risk. But do they monetize that? So, is that how Google make money? So, so is that why Eric Schmidt is worth a billion dollars? Yeah. So, so, so Google make money by selling data. I mean, you know, has anyone in this room ever paid Google a dollar? To the best of their knowledge. You have? How? 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 I run digital agents. Okay. Has any consumer, <laughs> as, as a customer of Google, and we're all apparently customers of Google, right? so, so it, it's impossible. You can't give Google money. Right? So, so there's a very smart thing that, 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 that says if you're not the customer, you're the product. And, and we are Google's product. So Google sell data on us to the people who, who think it's most valuable for them. The, the ethical catastrophe of Google knowing when a teenage a teenager is at risk of committing suicide is, is at some point they have to take a decision about whether or not they monetize that information and to who that information is most valuable to. And is it most valuable to the parents? Except that would breach their data rules, so they can't really do that. So, so they're going to, I mean, who well, they could sell it to us Americans. They can sell it to the marriage, they can also sell it to a funeral director. Or they can Not the funeral director, because they will keep it quiet. <laughs> what about their doctor? Unfortunately, their, their, data, their data ethical policies don't allow them from, for, to target an individual by name and by address, only by profile. It, it, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's scary. Yes. Um, as newspapers move uh, into the online space and sort of print uh, dies or sort of curtails, um, do you think we're going to see a decline in the quality uh, of journalism? So the example I have in mind is the independent uh, print and the independent online. Yeah, it, 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 unfortunately, if you're not the BBC, you have to you have to to to, to balance your income with your expenditure, like everyone else, every other person. So, so every newspaper is spending less and less on their content because they're earning less and less from the, I mean, advertising revenue in the newspapers is, is virtually dried up completely, and, and the, the cover price is, is, you know, doesn't, doesn't allow, um, uh, you know, the, the, the major newspapers used to employ a thousand journalists. That was, you know, that was sort of what you did if you ran any but um, local newspapers used to employ three, four hundred journalists. Now a national newspaper is running on somewhere between 60 and 150 journalists, and those are the quality ones. And local newspapers being run by between five and ten uh, people. You know, they're, they're, it, when I started, you know, a, a, a local newspaper would have three rugby correspondents. You know, if they're lucky, they have got one sporting editor. Um, yeah. But, and, and it's going to be worse. I mean, it's no wonder that the, the mail online is, is so popular is because it's got so many pictures. So now people look at pictures. They don't want to read anything. And uh, I mean, anybody read, you bought an uh, economist. I mean, I used to tell you economists that, that I think 1,000 uh, words is too long for anybody to read. So more the reason why now, I mean, when you talked about seven or eight seconds, and you just about enough time to um, you know, look at a photograph. And, and so nobody reads that. I mean, my view is that that, that all that erudite writing and so forth will have to be considerably shortened. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but do you, do you agree that that might be the case? I, 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 think, I think video will, will sort of 
largely take the place of, of, of written journalism. I, I, think, I think we're going to get into a, a much richer media. It, you know, in some ways, the media has been quite lazy in sticking with print. Um, it's, not, it's not a particularly efficient way of getting information or opinion across. Um, and and, and if, if, we're, if we're consuming everything digitally, then it's as easy to get video as it is to get um, uh, print. Is pornography still a huge <laughs> business? <laughs> no, it's not a business at all. It's all print. Uh, so how do they make money? Uh, with that, that, they, that they don't spend very much on their content. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. <laughs> yes. I want a bit. And then a man with a glasses and then another man with a half bit and half glasses. Hi, um, what do you think has been the biggest PR slash advertising resource for the last five years? Philip <coughs> uh, Green taking delivery of his 100 million pound yacht <laughs> last week. So, so, so that might be up there. <laughs> um, I mean, PR disasters are, are I mean, I, I think the really important role that the media plays is, is, is to give us information about the products and services and people that we, that, you know, who influence our lives. So, so you know, I, 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 I'm a, a, a fanatic supporter of a free press because I think we do need to know when, when companies or individuals or, 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 or politicians are, are doing one thing and saying another. Um, you, you know, there, there are clearly examples where, where, where people sort of shoot themselves in the foot for no particular reason. You know, the most, the most famous is Jared Ratner, who, who made a, you know, an amusing joke to his shareholders about why he made so much money because he sold crap. And, and then the Sun put that on the front page of the newspaper and that was the last time anyone bought his crap. And that was the last time that, 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 that his shareholders um, made any money. Um, I, you know, I, I think in, in the main, the media get it about right. I think they get it wrong on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think they get it right over a period of time. And I think we as consumers are very good at getting, at getting the, the right kind of idea about it. I mean, I, th I think we broadly know who's, who's decent, we broadly know who's, who's not. And so I, I think the value of PR is massively overstated. I think in the end, we all get the reputation we deserve. Um, not always for what we deserve it for, um, but 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 by and large, the the, the 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 media does a pretty good job of disseminating information, and we as consumers, I think, do a really good job of absorbing that information. So if you're me, when a camera says, "Look, Matthew," I mean, was I damaged uh, over the Panama Papers? What would you tell him? Because it's not a it's not like right now where it is a definitive. Uh, Consequence, you know, it, it, it comes and it so, so, testifying so, goes. So, 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 so an interesting thing. So, so, so that the the, you know, the, Pan the Panama revelations were about um, uh, a list of names of people who used an offshore structure to avoid tax, um, and the prime minister, through uh, something that his father had done, didn't actually avoid tax, but he, he it was clear that he made thirty thousand um, pounds in, in selling some shares before he went into parliament. Um, did it massively change the way any of us thought about him? I think people who thought he was a, he's rich, entitled, and part of that class um, would have had their suspicions confirmed. And people who thought he was a sort of decent politician who was doing a reasonable job of running the country would, you know, would not be massively dissuaded from that. The, the damage that that story did, and the timing was not a coincidence, is it came at the point where David Cameron was going to set out the stall for Britain remaining in Europe. And it damaged his ability to communicate with the country with credibility at a point where he really needed, in his view, to set out that case. And so, so that, you know, what, a, what a, a print media who is really determined to try and swing a vote for Brexit is doing is systematically undermining the credibility of people who are talking about Britain remaining in Europe. They struggle to argue coherently with the political or economic argument for coming out of Europe. So they just attack the messengers so that we won't necessarily hear the other side of it. So, so it, 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 it plays to my point of media being able to briefly and, and, and fleetingly affect the way we think about things.
but not actually affect our opinions in the long term, because actually I trust that we get it right. Yes. Yes. Go on. Sorry. Man, we change that. Um, in terms of identity politics and the growth there, how do you think that will affect media and advertising? Identity politics, what do you mean? People feeling part of a loyalty groups, identities. Do you understand the question? No, no can you, uh, <laughs> what do you mean? What do you think? I think people are becoming very, I don't know how to explain it, very loyal to identities and groups and turning off mainstream media, supply venues in other alternative Give us a places. concrete example. Well, people turning away from the newspapers, going to blogs, social media, and getting more of their information and facts from there. Right, I think we might have to pass the question over. But nobody's understood it, including yourself. <laughs> I'll just give you an example and give me another generic response. Right, the man next door, person. your friend, yeah. Okay. yeah. I think you would need to uh, pay the provinces first. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, where do you get your news from? Um, I, 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 I get it from Twitter, um, I, I, which, which is, is odd because Twitter looked like it was going to be the dominant platform for personal expression, and actually it's become an aggregated news platform where you get a series of headlines and links into mainstream news. So if, if I, I look at Twitter because if anything important has happened, it'll be on Twitter. Um, uh, I read the Times because it's an excellent news platform. Um, what in the, uh, yesterday, for example, what, what did you find the most interesting piece of news? Not today, because not everybody might have read it. Yesterday or the day before, this week, what? I uh, thought uh, the, 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 the Philip Green, um, the, the sort of, you know, the, the media has decided that Philip Green will be broadly held to account for what happened at BHS. And Philip is so far um, seemingly refusing to acknowledge that that's a legitimate line of inquiry. Um, uh, and How so, can they excuse Lady Green when in fact she was, she I think she owns everything? So, so if, you're, if you're not an English subject, you don't have to attend uh, a Parliament. Um, and so Philip agreed to attend if they withdrew the invitation to his wife. But it's, it's bizarre because she's actually the only beneficiary of BHS as the sole shareholder. Well, what would you advise Philip? Philip, yeah. give back the 400 million, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I can see any way out. I mean, he's rich enough, so he ought to. That's my view. But, but yeah. well, you feed him every night. <laughs> no, he, he, I don't think he's that's very <laughs> much. But um, if you were to ask me, I would tell him that um, you should go to me and I'll hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Yes. Thank you. I think I'm just going to rephrase that actual question because it was a really good one. Uh, right. Okay, good. Um, I think what he meant was that with, I suppose, bearded people identifying transgender or an ethnic minority and then finding, defining everything from that space and looking at media resources that purely see things that way and basically even very intelligent people finding a narrower and narrower echo chamber in which to learn things, discuss things and then come out of it with a, almost a thinking context that wouldn't have been the case before when you couldn't find a more niche <laughs> echo chamber. I think you've made it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, has anybody understood the question? Can somebody, uh, can, can you explain it? All right, let's see you smart ass. Go on. Can you explain it? No, answer it. Can you explain I, it? I think he's saying, <laughs> has, has in social media made it easier for people to find other people that reinforce their views rather than challenging their views? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just don't understand it, but uh, I think yes. Media is a plural uh, word, so have. Yeah. But, but has, social media, have. Um, it's a common yeah, question. No, I, I mean, that, so there, there is a question there. All okay. right. So I, what is the question? Repeat it. So, so the, 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 before you answer it, the, the question is about plurality of opinions. And, and, and 
So, so I, I, I think the interesting bit of the question is, is when you can find uh, a, a community around a particular identity or group. So, so uh, I, I remember when the, 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 the internet sort of first started and someone said, you know, if you're, if you're interested in collecting old bath water and you live in Scotland, it's possible that there is someone else who collects old bath water who lives in Ontario, and you're actually going to find each other. And, and, and suddenly it's going to be a less lonely life of, of being at the fringes of society with a particular interest. And, and, and so, so I am I'm very respectful of the gender equality movement. I think um, the focus on transgender is a, is a kind of remarkable thing. Um, I had understood it as being a very, very small niche. I now understand it to be a less small niche, but small niche it is. But, but it is inconceivable without social media and without the, the, um, the, the, the power of, of collective expression that this, this quantum change in the way society views transgender population could have happened. That, that they would have continued to be the butt of ill-advised jokes from the right word, generation. But. I'm sticking with it. Well, I'm sticking. Uh, that's I'm sticking with it. Um, so, so, so I, I think that Probably, it's, an, it's a very positive, um, and, and there aren't so many positive outcomes of the digital media revolution. I think there are, there's, a, there's an awful lot of very bad things that have happened. But, so but, the, but so you're, talk, you're saying that very minor views are now being able to be magnified and brought to the, to the front much more easily. So, so I think small communities who can aggregate their voice can be heard uh, collectively, where they weren't heard individually, and that's is that your question? No, no, no. 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 So just, no. just say yes. Yeah, so what? Easy thing to thank people. You have more messages. Yeah, but right. as, well, as what Matthew said, more or less, what you were asking. <laughs> and now I'm satisfied. All right, now I'm satisfied. Michael, I have to say, I have to give you the first prize for the most obscure question. <laughs> And most obscurely expressed, and and, um, and helped by others as well. <laughs> Three of you, two of you. Yeah, come on. Can we make it less? I mean, can we make it less a simple question? Like, you know, have you eaten today? Or something? <laughs> I could. Uh, what I'm actually going to ask is, you you were very strong on the freedom of the press, and do you think uh, it's sort of partly related to this transgender issue because? in universities, this issue of no platforming seems to be very prevalent amongst, we say, younger generations. And do you think that freedom of expression should be enshrined in our universities as well? Um, I, 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 there's nothing about freedom of expression not to support and celebrate, and, and unfortunately that means celebrating the freedom of expression from people who you don't agree with, and sometimes you don't and, and it's including people who, who choose to express themselves in a way that is profoundly wrong. Um, but, but you either have freedom of expression or you don't. And, and I think you know, one of the disconnects between social media and mainstream media is that mainstream media is able to take one opinion and hold it up as, as, as either very, very good or very, very bad. Um, and, 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 and bring it sort of out of context. So you get, you know, there was, there was someone who tweeted uh, a, I can't even remember what it was, it was some sort of apparently PR person who tweeted something about a footballer and got arrested um, for, because it was seen as racially inflammatory or it was seen, it was certainly, yeah, it was a, a, a crap politically incorrect opinion that was expressed. But, but when, when you take social media, which as you say is utterly, uh, 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 disposable uh, and transient, and then you elevate it up to other media, which is set in, you know, printing blocks and printed on newspapers and, and distributed. You, you can you can you can lose the context of expression, and so so the ability of, 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 of people at university to say whatever they want is, is fantastic. But at the moment, you've got an argument going on in universities about dis you know about. The, the, the National Union of Students being barred from Oxford and Cambridge because the current chair of the student union is um, is clearly anti-Semitic. Uh, 
those opinions expressed at a local level through social media shouldn't necessarily be uh, elevated to institutional uh, statements that are reported in national newspapers. So I, I think the, the, the filters that need to exist between transient media and permanent media need to be tightened up for the freedom of expression not to be a deficit. I don't know why we should include, I mean, it just, just combine it with universities. What's so special about universities? Well, it just seems to be uh, something that's changed generationally, and maybe it's part of the social media um, environment. Who's that? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Okay, well, uh, yeah. Um, right, that's a one final question. Uh, quite, okay, quick, three quick ones. No one, yeah. Matthew, who would you most like to work for right now that you're not already representing? My daughter, apparently. Um, you can't disclose the most interesting ones, right? I, I, um, are there any dictators or <laughs> genocide? There, there, are some, there are some world leaders who I think are doing very, very interesting things. Uh, but I, 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 would get in trouble, I would get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the lady at the back. Um, where do you think PRs can most add value to brands? Clients, marketeers. Um, I, I like that as the last question. I'm going to, I'm going to take right. it as the last question. So, 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 the reason that I like doing what I do, and the reason I still do it 31 years after I set up the company, when arguably I, I could, I could probably do less, um, is that the, the people come and talk to me and talk to Freud about people thinking better. I mean, you know, whether it's brands or individuals or institutions. They, 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 they all want people to think better. And, and, and we have a very, very sort of simple uh, solution to that, which is we say we'll be better. Uh, and and the, the way I think that our industry, the PR industry can, and marketing industry can assist and, and play a role in the world and in society is by encouraging companies to operate in a better way a, a, and a less harmful way to their environments and their stakeholders. And for us to get them the recognition and the plaudits they deserve for taking good decisions about how they treat their workers, about where they source their products from, about where they dispose of their waste from, about how they impact the societies and communities in which they're in. And if, if the reward for being a good company is that people will buy more of their products, then we're going to get more good companies doing more good things which will make our world much more sustainable. And, 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 you believe in that? and I do believe that. Bizarrely, at PR, which I, when I went into I thought was an immensely trivial industry, I think has actually become a reasonably important one because the only thing that can justify to shareholders why a company should spend more money on its supply chain or on its workers or on its community that it has to is if the reputational advantage is worth that extra investment, and that's something that we have to do I'm amazed. I'm amazed to believe in that, but, but there it is. Um, all right. <laughs> um, um, here it says, Matthew Boyd recently issued a public apology for the deafening noise coming from his £20 million mansion in Pembroke Hill during his annual London Fashion Week after party, where guests included Kate Moss and Bob Gaddock. Um, what was it really about? No. So why did you apologise? Because you should always apologise when the Daily Mail attacks you or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, let that be the pearl of wisdom that you take away. Always apologise to the Daily Mail when they're after you. Listen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Will you join me in thanking Matthew? Uh, for